Welcome everyone um, to the first in uh, uh, planned lecture series on the theme evidence, models and expedition. Um, the uh, lecture series is organized by uh, Philsa India, which is a loose association of philosophers of science, uh, unsurprisingly working in India. Um, and um, our first speaker uh, is uh, uh, Professor Harold Kincaid, um, who has very kindly agreed to be with us today. He is uh, Professor of Economics um, at uh, University of Cape Town in South Africa. He has uh, done a lot of excellent work on the philosophy of social science and philosophy of science in general. Um, and unlike, unfortunately, many philosophers of science, he um, is also actively involved in scientific work, uh, particularly on experimental economics. Uh, so uh, I couldn't, can't think of a better person to kick off this lecture series with. Um, we have... Um, uh, uh, lectures lined up until the 31st of October, although we'll be going uh, even beyond that. You can see some of the uh, forthcoming speakers uh, on the screen in front of you right now, hopefully. Um, and um, I would also ask uh, if you would like to be made aware of or receive announcements for future lectures. Um, we have a mailing list uh, that we can sign you up for. If you're interested in being signed up for the mailing list, um, I've posted a link on in the chat to a Google uh, document, a Google sheet. Uh, if you uh, go to that place and enter your name and email address, um, I'll add you to the mailing list and you can receive um, intimations about future uh, lectures in the series, announcements about future lectures in the series. Um, uh, okay, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, say too much in introduction. I'll let, I'll, I'll let you all get to the talk, which I'm sure you're all eager to get to. Uh, we'll save questions uh, for afterwards. I would request you all at this point to please mute your mics uh, so that we don't get any background noise. Um, and then I'll stop sharing and let Harold uh, take over the, the talk. Harold, uh, you can share your screen now. Okay, let's see. Well, a nice picture of California. Um, where am I? Let's see down here. Does that seem ready? Yes. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, great. Th thanks for ha having me. I don't know um, how severe your lockdown has been, but we've had one of the toughest ones in the, in the world, I think. Um, it's only just recently I could get out and walk my dog and go and buy beer. So uh, th the two main components in life. Um, so it, it's really nice to, to interact and Although this is a paper that's forthcoming, um, I still haven't sent in the final version, so uh, it's good for me to go back over it, and I certainly can use uh, any comments you have. And if you want to raise questions during a talk, that's fine with me, however you want to do it. Um, if it wasn't for the lockdown, I'd be in my office, and this is roughly the view from my office. Um, and just, or, you know, partly historical social uh, sake. In the middle of this picture, uh, there's a statue. It's a little guy in the, right uh, in the middle of the columns. And that is Cecil Rhodes um, of Rhodesia, like he owned the place. And he founded the University of Cape Town. And his statue is no longer there. And um, the removal of the statue started two years ago under the hashtag roads must fall and it eventually did and uh, really set off I think contributed to a lot of similar activities actually in South Africa and elsewhere so I just thought that's a little historical background of interest um, the project here is um, to look at questions about objectivity in the so in the social sciences um, and to argue really that lots of the questions are not uh, abstract, general, conceptual questions, they're more localized empirical questions, which is a general sort of theme I've been pushing um, for a long time about 
a variety of issues in philosophy of science. So I want to argue for that claim about objectivity and talk about what some of the questions are. Um, here's an outline of what I want to do. Uh, I'll start with um, in the first part, a sort of a naturalist contextualist stance with some distinctions. I called it a framework in my first draft of this paper, but the referee thought I was um, exaggerating. So um, now I call it a stance that seemed to make the referee happy. So, um, but it's not something terribly developed, but you could see where I'm coming from. And then the other parts of the talk, I look at um, arguments, uh, standard arguments around objectivity in the social sciences. In part two, I look at questions of underdetermination of theory by data uh, and what that says about objectivity. Part three, I look at uh, claims that social sciences are value laden and what that says about objectivity. And at the end, I have some brief things to say about some uh, ontological issues, um, questions about indeterminacy and social um, construction. Um, just to start out with a um, no doubt overly simple, but I think nonetheless important distinction. Name, um, objectivity can involve both epistemic and ontologic kind of uh, notions or questions. Uh, the epistemic ones are, of course, uh, ones about whether the social sciences get a truth, give decent evidence, etc. Ontological questions are, on the other hand, claims about the nature of the social world. Uh, does it have like special characteristics separating from the natural world? And what does that imply for social science? No doubt these two are interconnected, um, but it's helpful, for, at least for me, to start to separate them out. Parts two and three of the talk are about the epistemic issues, so the majority of the talk is about those. The last is about the ontological. Okay, so a, a bit of a framework to start with here, just sort of how I uh, want to approach these issues, and I think it helps. Um, my basic approach is what you might call contextualist. Uh, this is not uh, the view that you might find in mainstream analytic epistemology, which says some contextual thing has to be put in your analysis of X knows that Y, if and only if, and then a part of the list context comes in. It's um, rather a much more sort of pragmatist sort of anti-foundationalist notion that says, um, all judgments about evidence, support, and in the end I say explanation are relative to some kind of background knowledge, which is taken as given. So one slogan here is that we are never in the position of evaluating all of our knowledge at once. Um, reminds me of Hegel's comment about Kant, that uh, Kant wanted to learn to swim before he got in the water. Um, and this sort of approach um, says, no, you, um, you're always starting from something you've already got some kind of reason to believe. This suggests that universal inference principles, principles about I should um, infer X um, from Y, um, may be hard to come by when um, we get to empirical um, social science. Um, also, I think this is a bit of philosophical diagnosis. There's a, often a desire um, among social scientists um, and scientists in general, I think, to treat contingent local inference practices as if they were, you know, given by God and uh, universal and um, decide all questions. Um, I think progress. Um, on this view comes from looking at what the actual practices of the sciences are, what their su the support of those specific practices are, and what can philosophers add to the story to work. Um, the way I want to approach epistemic objectivity um, is not by trying to give you uh, a general conceptual and um, account of what it is to be objective, though nothing wrong with trying to clarify that. I think objectivity um, 
is really a lot like, for example, simplicity. No doubt simplicity is important, but it's pretty hard to pin down in the abstract. So um, I'm inspired here by Elliot Sober's work from some time ago. Um, and I see you having that as a, a speaker. Uh, I'm sure that will be very good. Um, he argued that simplicity in evolutionary biology really turns out not to be some general supra empirical um, virtue, but to uh, involve specific kind of empirical claims about how natural selection works. And, and that's the general um, attitude I have ab about um, objectivity. I, I want to see, I think it takes on real content uh, only when tied down to specific uh, empirical circumstances. Okay, so I'm claiming objectivity is an empirical issue, and um, I got good referee comments on the paper asking me, well, what do you mean by that? And um, roughly, um, maybe this helps a bit. Um, I sort of think of in terms of a, a continuum. Uh, from one side, um, very conceptual, um, uh, type questions, uh, logical questions, and on the other end, the observational end. And sort of given my quantum background, <clears throat> I put that in terms of there's an observational end of statements about um, observables, uh, statements that are rel relativized to a language, a theory, etc. But nonetheless, um, something we can pick out is um, relatively speaking about observables, and on the other end are uh, pieces of um, our web of belief that are uh, far removed. Um, my thesis then is that many claims about what is objectivity uh, in the social sciences are on the empirical end of that continuum. Some distinctions um, that are useful for talking about epistemological thesis. Um, we might distinguish consequentialist versus deontological approaches to objectivity. Um, hopefully this rings a bell from some ethics course you had somewhere or sometime. The consequentialist approach is what practices promote epistemic ends. So this, you look at the consequences that um, any action or any rule has. Deontological approach is um, want to know about what the rules, rights, duties, describing good belief are. Um, there are no doubt interruptions, but this has been a helpful distinction in ethics, and I think it applies to the ethics of belief, and that's talking about objecti objectivity is really a question of ethics of belief. Um, so if we look at the idea of objectivity approach, promote certain ends, then we have to ask what type of ends. And there are lots of things you can plug in here. And they might be statements, model, repre representations, explanations. Uh, if we st stick just to truth, you can ask, do, do we want the greatest number of truths, greatest truth to fa falsehood ratio, the minimum number of falsehoods, that might be Karl Popper. Um, all those are reasonable. Um, goals we might strive for. Are the goals um, individuals or are they uh, groups like scientific communities and what does that entail? I don't really think there's a right answer here, but I think we need to be clear about which of these things we're suggesting when we get into debates about objectivity in the social sciences. If I take a deontological approach that objectivity is an uh, epistemic, good epistemic trait in itself, then there's some kind of standard questions about that that uh, come from debates and metaethics. Which traits exactly are those that constitute objectivity? How do you justify them? Uh, can we justify them without having some kind of connection um, to the ends they promote? So this is the utilitarian criticism of a, a deontology. 
how do we trade off various virtues that things might have? Another standard um, issue in metaethics. Another useful distinction, I think, in terms of thinking about objectivity is the distinction between bias and uh, claims that are not reliable. Um, oh, uh, um, terms, the terms objectivity and no bias are often equated, but it's um, helpful to know that they're not the same. Um, being unbiased is less demanding than being objective in the sense of being probably true. Um, so for example, in causal inference, I may know, and I can, could give you circumstances, and we'll talk about it a bit below, that certain inference procedures are bound to make mistakes. They're biased. But I might still be in the situation where um, I can, not using a bias procedure, but whatever uh, inferences I make, I know I can't rule out all the consistent explanations. So I'm, I can't prove that I've got, uh, I can find the true answer, but I can show you that, that I'm not giving you false answers. So um, those kind of distinctions, I think, are important in debating objectivity. Uh, which of these two things are, are, are you asking about? Finally, an important distinction, which I ignore, um, which is that I can talk about objective results, but I can also talk about uh, objective communication of results. How do I present uh, results that I have? And for public policy issues and so on, this is a really important issue because there may be a variety of ways of describing the results from any particular study and how I describe those results um, might well um, reflect value judgments or other biases on my part. That's sort of a question in social epistemology. <coughs> um, it's an interesting one, but uh, as people say in papers, I cannot pursue that here, which I frequently, I think, means I don't know how to answer that. So uh, let's just say it's beyond the scope of the paper. It's an interesting topic, but I'm not going to discuss it. So my general approach is to focus on objectivity as reliable processes, and then ask what are the empirical questions in determining reliability. Um, so now I'm gonna look at arguments that seem to deny epistemic objectivity in social sciences, and argument, argue that these fail, uh, but that they do suggest interesting empirical possibilities. So now <clears throat> I want to move on to part two of the paper, which is under determination issues and objectivity. Um, under determination arguments um, would say that if social science claims are not determined by the evidence, if the evidence is not sufficient to uh, de decide them, then they are not objective. And this has been a kind of widely um, advance sort of reason for worrying about objectivity in the social sciences. <coughs> right away, you know, um, my training is sort of uh, uh, make as many distinctions as you can because um, uh, that's a route to progress. Darshi, Darshi, who's on this call, will know about that background. So, um, an important distinction here is between global versions and local versions of this, these underdetermination claims. Um, global ver versions say for any body, body of data, um, there will always be multiple incompatible theories supported by that set of data. Local versions say something much more specific. This uh, particular set of data cannot decide between hypothesis H1 and H2. And there's probably lots of stuff in between there, okay? The, just to get, you know, a bit of humor, or nerdy humor, I guess, um, the um, great illustrations of underdetermination issues, and particularly in observational social science or these kind of things. I don't know if you can read this or not, but the first one in the upper corner, says, hey, I did a regression. 
um, and that's a regression line. Um, and the next one says, I wanted a curve line, so I, I made one with math, so that's a quadratic line rather than a linear. And um, the third, uh, in the upper right-hand corner, that's the Donald Trump line. Look, it's tapering off. So the, uh, you look at that data and decide to draw that kind of curve, uh, a logarithmic curve, which sort of sin, seems to say the, cur the, the, the COVID uh, data, um, cases are declining. And there are lots of others in here. Um, I like the one in the bottom left-hand corner. I click smooth lines in Excel, and that's what you get with a, a line that really fits the data quite well. But it's, uh, yeah, uh, a bit ad hoc. So the point is, uh, um, given a set of data, the under determination um, claim is that there are multiple ways to draw the line, as it were. Um, so in my reliable terms, this under determination worries are that we do not have methods that reliably pick out the truth uh, among the competing competitors. The standard argument for this is usually from the holism of testing. And that's the frequently put as the claim that evidence only bears on the theory as a totality. And the argument is, the one argument is that um, anytime you test something, you have to have background theory. Uh, you can't do a test without assuming certain things about the setup, et cetera. And so what you end up with is what Klein called the web of belief. And because there's a web of belief, um, you can always make changes in various places in the web. And you can do so in the way that the same data, data set supports two different webs of belief. That's the general metaphor. Um, the problem is that's a metaphor. And people frequently move from the idea of holism of testing, which is reasonable enough, to a much stronger claim that only holes are tested. Some kind of quantifier mistake is. is uh, you might say. Uh, that's a fallacy, uh, but it's still surprisingly ignored. Um, the holism of testing itself is compatible with distributing credit and blame to specific hypotheses. What's fundamental is that we have evidence for the background assumptions that we use. Um, that are independent of the evidence for the, that we are using to test the hypothesis. Um, Bayesians and non-Bayesians and lots of others can argue over what independent evidence is, but the general point I think is pretty clear is that we want this kind of situation. H is supported by, um, or E supports H, H probably ideally entails E, it requires A to do so, but A itself uh, has its own evidence. Um, when that's the case, we can distribute um, praise and blame um, because um, we can triangulate among the various components. Another answer to the under determination question, um, which really only, um, this is not in the paper, and it only occurred to me that it's obvious in recent days because I've been writing a paper on causal modeling. And um, the reply to the determination issue, uh, the second one, is that, okay, suppose we have under determination. Suppose we have two theories compatible with the data. The story's not done then because theories have structure. They're not some blob that's just pushed up against the data, they have component parts, and it's conceivable that competing theories um, consistent with the data nonetheless share some components. So for example, this is from an, another paper I'm writing on cause, causality and economics. Um, look at the causal model on the left, causal model one. 
x1 causes x2, x3 causes x2, x4 causes x1, and is caused by x3. Well, that model by itself, um, it doesn't rule out other models. And on the right is what you, you can call the equivalence class. That it's, it's a set of all the models com compatible with the implications of model one. Model one has various logical implications. Um, among them is if you fix X2, then X3 and X1 will uh, be correlated, um, and, and several others. The equivalence class gives you all the models that have the same implications as model one and tells you what other models are still possible. So lines without arrowheads on them there could be a set, the equivalence class says there could be a causal relation running from x4 to x1, or there, your data, any data consistent with model one implications, it could also run the other way. Same thing about the relationship between x3 and x4. So there are four other models consistent with the implications of model one. But notice the equivalence class, all these other models all have a the causal relationship x1 to x2 and x3 to x2. So even if there's underdetermination, if we find evidence consistent with model one, we know there are other models that, are, that may be true, but they all have this one fundamental causal relationship. So underdetermination doesn't mean we don't know something about what's going on causally. So the moral here really is, to me, it's not a simple matter going from evidence to hypotheses. Whether under determination of the threat depends on your background knowledge. And um, there are two basic questions we have to ask. Does the hypothesis at issue fit the data? And are alternative explanations of the data plausible? Certainly in the social sciences, under determination problems are serious. Uh, especially when we're using purely observational data. So a very simple example, <clears throat> suppose I have correlations between C and E, C and M, M and E. Um, two possible models with the, those correlations are, the, are models A and B. And the correlations by themselves cannot decide between them. But nonetheless, we know if we fix, we can control M and C and E are still correlated, that rules out model A. Because we fixed M, then there should no longer be a correlation between C and E. And similarly, if we fix C, hold it constant by uh, statistical methods, then M and E shouldn't be correlated. So um, even when we have a determination here, we can still make inferences. Okay, I don't think I have time for this. Um, so the general moral of the determination problem for me is that it's a threat, that there are ways to deal with it sometimes. And it's an empirical question, a case by case question, whether we can actually successfully deal with it. Okay, all right. So now moving to part three of my talk. How am I doing time-wise? Um, am I okay? Okay. All right. Well, I'll <laughs> I'll just continue then. Okay. So on to claims that social science is value laden. Uh, this is um, widely asserted about the sciences in general, uh, and certainly about the social science. But I think it's frequently insert, asserted without any clear statement of what it means. So you've got Heather Douglas coming. She's written a lot about this, uh, pointed out lots of different um, um, meanings of the term. But here are some helpful distinctions that people don't be clear enough, if you ask me. First, it is the claim that science, science or social science has to be value-laden or just that it uh, can be, it frequently is, and so on. Um, 
Another question is what kind of values are you claiming are involved? Are they epistemic values or non-epistemic? Surely uh, the implications are much bigger or different if they're epistemic versus non-epistemic. Are the values actually used in the science? Or are they implications of the science? And this comes up a lot in policy issues. Um, you might have claims about the genetic basis of traits, for example, that have some kind of value implication when those um, empirical claims are combined with background approaches, but not part of the science itself. <coughs> what part of the science is value laden? Science is a lot of different stuff. Um, are the values involved in defining problems and the questions asked? Um, that's much less of a, a big deal than if um, values are involved in determining what the evidence is or what the explanation is. And if you say science is value laden, after you've answered the other the questions I just asked, um, what are the implications supposed to be? What are the implications in particular here for objectivity? Um, one group of, of arguments that that science and the social sciences in particular are value-laden um, argues from underdetermination. Um, the idea is that um, theory is underdetermined by data. Something has to come in um, to help us decide what to believe. Um, the data doesn't tell us. So values come in and help us pick out um, which theory, which hypotheses uh, to believe. Um, this is a strong value laden claim, and um, it would make um, central parts of the science perhaps uh, non-objective. OK, I, I'm not convinced by this kind of argument. First, it assumes under determination is true, and I don't think that's always the case, as I just argued. But even if it were true that there's always under determination, you have to ask yourself, um, why does it have to be values, especially normative, um, um, moral, political values, that decide what we believe when faced with um, competing theories that we can't pick between? Uh, why not just say, well, I, I don't know what to believe now. I, uh, I know some things not to believe, but I, I can't decide and I need to gather further evidence. Um, so I'm not convinced that under determination by itself shows that I must um, use values in um, making decisions about what to believe. Um, nonetheless, I think it's certainly right uh, that under determination is a threat, as I've already sort of pointed out. And it's a clear place where values can come in. It's certainly possible in lots of, po especially public policy debates, for people to argue they have evidence for some claim that has moral importance. And um, for them not to mention alternative explanations compatible with the evidence they just cited. Uh, but that's something we've got to sort out case by case, I think. Another argument, and again, you could talk to Heather when she comes about this, um, are inductive risk arguments, which go back to Rudner in the early 50s, which basically the argument for Rudner was um, epistemic decisions can't, aren't made solely based on the data. Um, you have to look at the consequences of being right and being wrong. And if, you ha if being wrong has huge consequences, you may ask for more data than uh, if not. Um, and that certainly seems right as a general question about the ethics of belief. Um, but I, I don't see that that um, shows that um, my science is necessarily um, qua science, qua evidence, uh, value laden. Uh, it seems to me there's still se two separate questions. There's first, how much evidence do I have? And then secondly, how confident do I want to be? And uh, if, if bad things are going to happen, then I want to be more confident 
and then I may say I need more evidence. But how much evidence I have and it's a separate question. It's certainly possible, and I'm sure the social science research does it with some frequency, to run together these things. Um, but again, and this, I'm sure this is getting boring and I'm repeating it over and over, but um, it's my idea. Um, it's uh, got to be a case by case empirical type question of, of uh, how strong the evidence is and how much we care about the consequences and, and how they interact, I would think. Another argument for value ladenness um, that I think is really interesting comes from John Dupre. Um, and you can see this in debates over race and, and uh, gender issues and so on, <coughs> is that social science classifications are inherently evaluative. That's John Dupre's argument. He, he grants that the, it's not always the case, but he thinks it's largely the case. And the argument I've listed up here. Um, basically, the classifications that we want from the social sciences are though that those that interest us or involve our interests. Any classification that involves our interest is a validative. It provides reason, reasons for acting. Value-free social science would not do this, thus any useful social science is value-laden. And I think the question about the status of social science classifications and their objectivity is a really uh, important one. Um, but I'm not convinced by this argument. Um, you know, there are premises here that I think are false. <coughs> I mean, so for example, I have a strong interest now in explaining the, the effects of uh, certain proposed vaccines for the, the COVID. Um, but um, I don't think the fact that I have an interest in that makes my data about um, what vaccines work and don't work um, necessarily value laden. Um, value laden is um, my interest in the question. Value laden is um, what should I do with a vaccine that has a say 50% um, um, effective rate. Um, but what my data are in, in this 3,000 group of people, uh, uh, I think, um, is not value even if I have a great interest in the study. Um, so if, it's, if not all um, social science is value-laden, then we have to ask, well, how much and why and uh, how does that work in practice? Again, great questions, but again, I think local and empirical. Um, and then I have a general response to worry about values in social sciences. It's that even if you values all the way down, as it were, it's still possible to make the role of values explicit in um, work that you're using, presenting, relying on, and uh, that, and then make your claims um, relative to the values that you've acknowledged. So let me give you an example. Decisions about what the gross domestic product is requires decisions about what to include in, in things we count as economic activity. And for example, a, a biggest decision is the, do we count um, household work? Um, uh, current GDP um, um, calculations do not count household work. Um, if I make a chair at home in my spare time, that's not adding to the GDP. If I go to work, work to make it in a, in a workshop, that does contribute. Uh, you can see how the, the feminists, how feminists might bring this issue up because uh, there's a bias in how household work is distributed. Um, However, um, I can be clear in making policy recommendations exactly what assumptions I made about measuring GDP and which ones might actually um, 
have um, value implications. Um, and I think it should be possible then um, to say, okay, uh, this measure doesn't measure household activity, this one does, what do those differences imply for policy and so on. Um, but I think I can have an objective um, empirical discussion of GDP and its effects if I make clear what the value decisions I have made. Um, I've come across this a lot in some of my own research. I've been doing some addiction research for some time. Um, yeah, about a decade, I started doing work in South Africa on pathological gambling. <coughs> um, just to give you an example, um, pathological gambling, there, there are people who go to casinos and slot machines and they wear diapers. Um, and in fact, the casinos have special bins, garbage cans for people to put their diapers in. So they don't have to get up from the um, slot machine if they think they're on, on a lucky streak. So people basically urinate in their diapers and continue gambling. And that's, that's a kind of uh, sign of pathological gambling. Uh, but there are all kinds of ways and um, measures and questionnaires, et cetera, to measure pathological gambling. And the question is, how do you separate the pathological from just, I'm having a good time? Um, we, what we've done is used uh, criteria like, do you make repeated costly attempts to quit uh, gambling? Or um, same thing for, for other uh, addictions. Um, you can ask if there are values involved in this uh, decision, uh, the, uh, in this definition. Uh, maybe there are. Um, but we can measure, you know, number of attempts and we can measure the costs in various ways. Um, and when I, um, I'm, I'm explicit about how I measure uh, repeated attempts, I can use those measures to see wh whether I can predict other things. And I think I can get something of an objective result, even if addiction itself uh, seems like it's bringing in values. Okay, so I'm far as the way through. Um, time wise, yeah, you can uh, go till uh, you can go another fifteen minutes or so. I have to... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, so I'll move on to, to the um, uh, ontological issues rather than epistemic ones. Um, this is more work in pro kind of work in progress, but. Here are two things um, I've been thinking about. Um, let me see. Um, no, it's not going the right way. Let's see, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, there are two arguments I want to look at. I don't have them laid out here as clearly as I thought I did. The first one is an argument. Um, and basically what we're talking about here is now we switch from what can I know to what's the social world like. And that's going to have implications for what the social sciences could be like, but it's a, um, put as an ontological question about the nature of social reality. And once, um, so um, the question then is, uh, are social phenomena as phenomena in the world objective in the same way that uh, things are objective in the natural sciences, for example. And there are arguments out there that, that no, they aren't. One of them comes from a tradition um, that Quine represents, but there are people from, um, actually from uh, very uh, different traditions that reach similar kind of Quinean conclusions here, for, for example, the hermeneutic tradition, 
Um, which uh, that, that claim that there's no fact of the matter about the things that social scientists want to study, like linguistic meaning and, and related uh, psychological states, attitudes, and so on. It's a kind of, um, it looks at those things and says they're inherently different than um, the kind of things that physicists study. Um, and um, there are a variety of ways to put this. One um, that I find particularly compelling comes from um, a social psychologist, I think, uh, named Michael, uh, is, um, who argues that all these um, measurement tools, personality trait studies, etc., that psychologists come up with are basically uh, based on a mistake because social phenomena, um, psychological phenomena are non-quantitative. They don't come in <coughs> addable units. And so they're not measurable. They're not the kind of things that are measurable. So social phenomena are indeterminate in this way. Um, you can guess that I, I find these kind of blanket announcements about the social sciences too broad and sweeping. Um, and I immediately began to look for uh, counter examples, something else I was trying to do. So I immediately ask, okay, here's a little piece of behavioral science. I measure your uh, um, cortical hormones, um, cortisol. And uh, I infer that if you've got very high levels that you're under stress. And this is a widespread uh, uh, um, test uh, for these kind of things. Um, got lots of, um, it's useful in predicting lots of things about you. And I can measure the amount. So uh, there is a piece of um, behavioral science, at least, that's not indeterminate and is quantitative. Um, and then I go to say, is it really true that when we study psychological attitudes and beliefs um, that we can't tell, um, at least tell the difference between what are really bad answers and what, what are acceptable answers, even if we can't pick out the exactly right answer. Um, and I, as social survey researchers, and experimental economists uh, work, I kind of do you go to great trouble to try to rule out biasing factors when you're trying to measure people's, uh, say, risk attitudes. And we separate those risk attitudes from a variety of other things. And we worry that they're confounded by them and we control for them. And we do all of that. Um, and so it looks like, um, even for the things that seem like they must be uh, you know, indeterminate that we can take u the usual scientific steps to show we have objective results. Um, and then there's a question about um, just how strong a demand do you have to have for things to be ontologically objective. Uh, Mitchell, Michael wants, um, you know, reality to always be quantitative. Uh, but uh, why can't reality just be, as it were, rankable? Um, awful lot of microeconomics and the kind of uh, uh, experimental economics work I do, we do, um, just assumes that um, we um, choices and behavior are ordinal. That is, you can rank some higher uh, or lower on some kind of scale. Uh, without having to measure how far they are on the scale. Okay, so I, I, uh, interesting question, but I think, again, I would want to look and show me specifics and see what, what we can do. Um, okay, this is a slide that's out of the way. A second, um, I think this is interesting. It sort of takes me back to the, my old uh, 1970s radical um, left winger days, uh, debate, uh, these debates about ontological status really tie into the old debates in the social sciences over what, you know, at times have been called materialism and idealism. And, um, I think that issue is, uh, 
really is an empirical issue rather than a big philosophical issue to be decided on broad conceptual grounds. And so I can tr translate that debate um, to uh, pretty empirical questions. So questions like um, how essential are, are, are individual preferences in explaining economic behavior? Uh, Gary Becker, a famous economist, uh, showed that under certain assumptions, even people who choose randomly will nonetheless produce a downward sloping demand curve if they have budget constraints. So uh, it's an empirical question, how far can you get by looking at the environment and the constraints it imposes on in individual behavior and explaining that behavior. And sometimes you can get pretty far. So in that sense, the ideas don't matter. It's the, um, the immaterial nature of the environment. Um, then in the social sciences, we have all kinds of cases where there's really a debate about, can we explain social phenomena entirely in terms of individual beliefs, individual norms, and so on? Or do we have to bring in such things as organizations, states, classes, et cetera? And uh, an issue I've looked at some in which you're no, no doubt probably have much better knowledge base than I do, and a uh, question I'll end this talk on. Um, how do we explain caste? The materialism idealism debate uh, can be translated into a debate. Um, there um, have been people in the history of writing about caste, like Dumont. Uh, um, who thinks caste can entirely be explained on the basis of sort of Hindu ideology, and others who think that's an, um, mistaken and want a more materialist explanation where they think um, kinship, economic status, a variety of things involving power are uh, crucial to explaining it, and that Dumont's explanation um, is inadequate. Uh, but that is, uh, to repeat my theme, an empirical kind of local question uh, uh, about objectivity uh, in the ontological sense. So I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Harold. Um, uh, there is one of the costs of this kind of talk is that uh, you can't hear the applause that I'm sure from uh, everyone yes. who's participating. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'll open it up for discussion now. Uh, and uh, what I'd, uh, uh, if you want to uh, ask a question, I would request that you use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Uh, and if you don't know how to use that, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, there's, a, there's a link for the participants list. Once you open up the participants list, there should be a raise hand uh, button at the bottom of the list. Uh, so if you have a question that you'd like to ask, uh, please uh, raise your hand and I'll call you uh, in the order I see hands raised. Uh, I have a couple of requests before I start uh, calling on people. Uh, the first is uh, that since there are a number of people and I assume we're going to have a lot of questions, please try to keep your questions brief um, and also uh, try to keep it to one question at a time. If you have a second question, you can always raise your hand again and back to you eventually. Okay, Jyoti Kishore has a question. Uh, please go ahead, Jyoti. You can unmute your mic and, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. So uh, my question is related to underdetermination of a scientific theory. So the epistemic challenge that arises due to underdetermination is more of a methodological challenge that constantly arises in the course of scientific practice. So in a case of any observational falsification, which happens when the world does not live up to the theory grounded expectation, we must give up something like uh, we can something that we we must give up something and something we cannot give up or we should not give up like we cannot give up the background knowledge or the assumption so as quine argued that we all that all the beliefs that we hold at any given time are linked in an interconnected web and a conflict with experience at the periphery will require a readjustment in the interior of field so um, there is a solution uh, that you showed us where we could see two causal models and you, like it was like showed like the way some data points can fit, fit to the first model as well as to the second model 
and those both hypotheses need not contradict each other but uh, my query is can we really do that because uh, according to coin no particular experiences are linked with any particular statements in the interior of the field though indirectly the F, we 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 will see the effect like how it affects the field as a whole but can this kind of solution really uh completely ca can do away with the threats that is posed by under determination of a, a scientific theory thanks yeah um yeah that's uh, nicely put it's sort of the general sort of quinean uh, picture um and um i think in fact you know quine himself i mean quine was reacting to the logical empiricism and you know a specific version of that which tried to translate you know theoretical statements into observational statements and translate you know you know a very tight if and only if type way and that proved impossible and um in his later years quite himself sort of thought maybe he'd gone a bit uh, too far and that's sort of um and, and trying to counter the empiricist view that uh, you can translate uh, all the theoretical statements into operational ones without loss of anything uh, that he was arguing against. But um, that view doesn't say that um, if we have sufficient background knowledge, we can uh, tie specific experiences to specific um, um, hypotheses, assumptions, uh, observation statements, and so on. So it's always going to be a matter of relative to what we know, but um, it's a little hard to see how we even would get on in the world, to be honest. If all we could do is say, I've got some experience and I've got a theory and um, I can't differentiate um, any part of the theory in terms of what it says about uh, the world. Um, so if you look at my example here, you know, now I'm getting practical here. I mean, I'm looking at these models. I've got a model um, like this that I'm um, using in the paper um, on causation. And it's question is whether there, there's such a thing as a resource curse. Um, it seems like countries like Nigeria that have, have lots of resources or Venezuela turn out to grow more slowly than countries that don't have a lot of resources, which is kind of counterintuitive. And what's our evidence on that? Well, I've got measures of GDP. Yeah, I've got measures of um, oil production and so on. And, and um, then I have association between those things over, you know, four decades. So um, to me, I'm, I'm saying in this case, sure, I've got a bunch of assumptions in there, but I've got my data on GDP and I, I sort of know what that is. And it took a lot of theory to get there. I, I grant that. But the data on GDP is a lot different than my data on um, other factors I'm looking at. Um, you know, one of the factors would be um, Tropics, non-tropics, for example, and that's pretty objectively measurable, and that doesn't have much to do with GDP. So, um, while well, your general statement about the web of belief and the difficulty of tying things down um, is, in a way, I, I certainly agree. I, I think, um, in practice, given enough background knowledge, we can tie some things down. And it's always modular, you know, uh, given that knowledge. But um, I guess there's a reliable argument that um, I think it tends to work um, in a variety of circumstances. Never know. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, Raja, uh, yeah, you have a question as well? Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're audible. At least to me. I don't know if you're able to handle it again. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're audible, yes. Great, great, great. Thank you, Harold. Uh, a question, uh, I, mean, I guess I feel a little bit like the uh, referee and would like to ask you a little bit more about what objectivity uh, is 
and how it's uh, how it's. Um, I mean, I don't. I, you, you, I know you don't want to give uh, necessarily sufficient conditions, but you said you talked about um, it being an empirical matter uh, a number of times, and you, I think, very briefly specified it as reliable processes. And uh, so, if you could talk a little bit more about that, and and specifically, given that reliability is typically uh, specified in terms of truth. Um, one could think that you know a pragmatic version of this is available, where you know what you have is success, and then you talk about rationality or something, but but not necessarily truth and knowledge. Mm. Um, so that that's mm. just you know, the general gist of the question. If you could talk a little bit more about that, it would be great. Yeah, you know that's a good question, and um, yeah, I understand. Um, um, but it's kind of contextual position is always on the edge of just sort of um, really pissing people off because you you just sort of say oh that that's an empirical question and, and run away and it sort of seems like there's a lot more to say than that um, and I understand that um, um, you know a lot I gave this talk a year ago in, in uh, Norway. Um, and I had, being a, coming from a background of making distinctions, I had even more distinctions about what we want reliableism to come to. And it's, it would be perfectly reasonable, as you suggest, to say we, uh, some method or procedure is objective in the sense that it reliably produces and then not stick in truth as, as the goal, but something like, um, 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 results uh, that are confirmed by some other process that I think is really good. So um, I can um, have, um, you know, the standard thing about uh, multiple routes to the truth. Um, um, you know, I have one measurement that um, done one way and one measurement done another and I'm more confident in some measurements than than in others but all I have are the measurements but I show that the other one measurement is consistent with the, the first measurement and so it could be what I've got there I'm promoting is not the truth but some kind of preferred measurement um, that's my outcome and I show that some other method is reliable and that it produces it so I th think there are a lot of things you can put <coughs> put in there as the goal to be pursued and I, um, that, that may seem um, abstract but then I would argue well but it gets interesting when, you, when we start um, talking about specifics and that's the stuff that really gets me interested um, you know so I know I get certain results using the fMRI um, can I um, uh, take those results and compare them to something I might get by a physiological test or by some kind of um, you know, behavioral test, et cetera. Um, and, and that's quite a level of belief again. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I think objectivity gets more content uh, because the more you tie it down to specific things you're doing. Um, so I don't know. If I'm disagreeing with you, or I'm just being vague, but um... well, thanks. That's that's helpful. I mean, just as you say that you know you can plug in something else for truth there. That's that's what I wanted to you know hear you say. So I'm happy with that. <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, Darshi uh, has a question. Please unmute your mic and ask. Oh, hello. Uh, okay, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I am uh, deontologically obligated to attack you as a revenge <laughs> for all, all those times, all those times you beat me in tennis. Okay, and <laughs> I've I, got many times actually. <laughs> okay, I formulated, I tried to formulate one consolidated question. I don't know if it captures everything, but I will put it because a lot of other people are here. Okay, as a, as a thoroughgoing empiricist and as a thoroughgoing contextualist, localist, which I like, 
uh, are you not committed to not presuppose either objectivity, either in its deontological or consequentialist sense, or presuppose no objectivity due to an due to an implication of indeterminacy, supposedly. Okay, I ask this question because I, I know this is very uh, this may not be fair because you you do not begin with the local in your paper, right? So you, you but you begin with certain global conceptions of objectivity, though of you know different types, and uh, um, uh, and and then you bring in the local later. So so, so mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting is. Can, can we go back to an old-fashioned inductivism, maybe, uh, and and not make any uh, generalization, even of a meta a, a meta theoretical claim, until uh, uh, you know it arises from the all the uh, local examples. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, my my favorite way of beating you was to call balls out that that were in. So, <laughs> as we were taught by our our professor George Not <laughs> Um Darcy and I had the same professor, and we who we played tennis with separately, and we um, found that over time by independent measurements that that Professor Nachnikian sometimes seemed to not exactly see things the way they seem to be. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, those are good questions. I mean, there's the first question about how do you justify the contextualist position to begin with? And um, then there's going to be, you know, a meta epistemological question. And then there's going to be a lot of burden shifting and denying that the other side is answering the questions and stuff, I'm afraid. Um, so, um, you know, my, if I wanted to get, um, you know, more philosophical than I'm capable of at the moment, uh, but, I, you know, I would be saying, well, you know, your view entails skepticism and here's why it entails it and, um, but isn't skepticism a stupid position? And then we'd go back and forth for a long time. And so, I, you know, I would suggest looking at like Michael Williams's work on contextualism or Mark Wilson's stuff. If you haven't read it, um, uh, Wandering Significance, and he has a new book, you know, wonderful stuff. Um, and, and really, it, it gets to parts of it sound like Wittgenstein and, and therapy and so on. So that's one set of questions you're asking, and <laughs> you're certainly right that I don't answer those here. The other question you're asking is, um, you know, maybe we don't need that sort of spiel at the beginning. Let's just start looking at some cases and see what we can find. And um, won't we find, and then I would think, um, you might ask, won't we find that you know, we start looking at some cases, and what we find in some cases is just what I painted, which is something very local and contextual. And we may find other kinds of inquiry, or that's not what we find. What we find are general rules of inference that work quite well, they're deeply embedded, and uh, they get us a long way. And uh, maybe that's what you should be doing, as, as it were, starting from the bottom up and seeing how things go. Um, and I think that's a really interesting su suggestion. And if and, um, uh, uh, can I just say, I think I, uh, the first one, I think you misunderstood. I, I did not ask for justification of contextualism. I am totally bought in to your thoroughgoing empiricism and thorough, thoroughgoing contextualism. Second one, you got perfectly right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, 50%. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks, uh, Sahana has a question. Uh, could you unmute and ask it? Hi. Uh, hi. So uh, my question is about how your position would sort of relate to scientific metaphysics. I, I remember you had a paper in that anthology also on scientific metaphysics. And I wanted to ask a question specific to that. And uh, like, given that Lederman in his system sees 
objective modal structures to be captured by fundamental physics and you know not by social special sciences how would you generally sort of look at it in connection your position of contextualism in relation to that kind of position like ladyman's position or osr that's pretty much okay all right yeah mr ladyman uh, who's actually a good, fairly good friend um um there's a second name aside from Ladyman. Um, um, he sometimes calls himself Aaron Aardvark. That's because uh, when he and Don Ross and initially three others were writing that, that book, they, uh, there were going to be five or six authors. And so one of them declared that they were changing their name to Aardvark. And then they all began to come up with first names that all, had all A's. Um, so I, I've followed that work for quite a while. I, you know, I don't think it's their view that um, only physics can find uh, the objective modal relations. I think it's their view that um, they're what they call real patterns going back to Dennett um, and that those can be picked out by not just physics, but by the special sciences. Um, and that would be the view that I would think is right, which is that uh, there are multiple ways of finding and describing and um, finding real patterns, uh, to use Dennis's term, which are patterns that um, uh, convey information um, that both physics and the uh, social sciences can pick out. So if physics is fundamental, it's not because only it can pick out objective patterns. It's for some, you have to give another story about that. And Ladyman and Ross have a story about th th that. Um, and um, I, you know, I would talk about supervenience. That's not exactly what they want to talk about. Um, but I think there is a, a story that that can be told. Um, and to me, <clears throat> I mean, there's a metaphysical question, but I, I you know, I, I, I love it when I can turn a metaphysical question into um, a question that has empirical bite. And so in my own life now, we, we do these experiments, choice experiments. So people are choosing lotteries you know you prefer more now uh, or more later or less now and you make a bunch of choices and then we get um, the data is all those choices and then we've got this question well and they should we this uh, should we infer that behind those choices those pattern of choices that there's some latent thing like their you know their real attitude about the future or about risky situations or should we just stick with the patterns in the data and can you know what how much explanation can we do by just sticking with the patterns in the data and that's to me a concrete instance of your question right is it the patterns in the data that are real and that's the objective modality if you want to use um, because we can infer what other choices they would have made so we can get those modal statements out of that. And is that the, should we just be sticking with that or should we be postulating something more than that? And that turns the big metaphysical question into a, a, a local empirical question. And I, I you know, um, I, fi I find that, um, um, you know, I'm not denying that they're the big questions, but I, it, it excites me when I can actually turn that the, the big question into, into a smaller one that has some consequence. So I'll, I'll just probably drop you uh, a mail later because they have the second order and the first order real pattern. So yeah, I mean, so we can discuss this later. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. Sure, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks, Anna. Uh, Don, uh, you can go ahead with your question. Please unmute your mic. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Kincaid. Thank you for your wonderful talk. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, so my question was uh, 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 when addressing uh, underdetermination, um, 
especially with cases involving <clears throat> causal inference. Um, your suggestion was, look, um, uh, take this example of you know, two different models, find the right structure, and that should be able to uh, give you a way out. And uh, you said, look, if you control for uh, variable and if there's a correlation, then you can you know, um, pick out which is the right one. Uh, now, uh, I also want you to help me whether there's a question here, because I was sort of, I mean, I was not sure whether you know, this uh, procedure or approach is totally without values. Um, because, I mean, I know that in causal modeling framework, if I were to, you know, look for you know, uh, the background, uh, uh, no, uh, the back door criterion, then someone could say, no, use the front door criterion. Uh, uh, because in there are some cases where you can't just control because of ethical issues. And if you know the, uh, mediating mechanisms use the front door criterion so is it that look if you have if you are possible if it is possible to make use of these uh, mathematical tools then we have a objective result obtaining or is it that look e e even in these cases what you might do is since we are bringing it down to the local empirical issue uh, we, we, we are making use of some background knowledge and as you said look here we can make use of the uh, reliable uh, knowledge producing uh, mechanisms in which case I'm just wondering look I mean is it are these knowledge producing mechanisms uh, when you bring it down to the local level uh, does it call for uh, a different reliabilism I mean what I'm asking is look do should we make a distinction between local reliabilism and global reliabilism uh, uh, so that's just mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, yeah that's that's interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I would. It would be helpful if you could spell out. I mean, I always like distinction between local and global, so it sounds good to me. But um, um, I'd like to spell it out more. Um, like, what are we trying to say here? Um, here, I just work with your question. You can work with me. Um, I, I certainly can imagine, I mean, you know, the more local it is, the more, probably the more background knowledge I have, probably, you know, the more leverage I have. And so the reliableism, you know, looks like it works. Um, the further I get away from the local, and I'm talking about uh, much bigger things, um, and then the less background I, knowledge I'm, you know, um, I'm taking for granted, then um, the less re reliableism looks like an answer to um, the worry somebody has. So I, I'm not sure. You want to spell it out a little further? What, what yeah, I'm worried mean, about. Or? Right. I mean, I think I thought I think I got something clear because uh, my understanding was: look, when you make the questions more local, um, you get more. Uh, I mean, if you're saying, look, we increase the number of background knowledge claims that we have, um, it sort of appears that, look, it is still restricted to the local empirical issue that we are dealing with. Um, whereas uh, if, you're, if you're saying, look, uh, let's not go so local at the general level, if there is some appeal to knowledge claims, much more broader general knowledge claims, then aren't these two knowledge uh, producing mechanisms different. Uh. Mm. Yeah. Um, so your question is sort of, you know, are there two kinds of two senses of, of reliable or, or does reliable work in the local case, but it's harder to do in the global case because I'm probably going back to the first question, if you, you know, you're entirely global as it were, then aren't you um, just in that quiet situation with a huge web of belief and um, a lots of data and then to talk about reliableism sounds, yeah, how would I answer the skeptic um, with a reliableist argument, for example? Uh, if the, the doubt is about the very um, veracity of the data I have. Um, 
and, and you know, it's a way. In a way, it's connected to what I took to mistakenly took to be Darcy Darcy's question, which is sort of a meta epistemology question about what you're doing here and how you. What are the standards for judging? You know, epi, epistemological claims rather than making them, which is a, a meta kind of question. Um, yeah. So. Um, I guess to me, what would be interesting is to turn your question into, again, to some controversy I can um, I could use to analyze, um, and where um, the controversy had two aspects: one, a local reliableness claim, and then really another much broader knowledge claim that. Is not so easily decided on reliable terms. <clears throat> so maybe um, you know, um, I mean, questions about introspection as evidence, for example, um, um, things like that, which which are a lot harder to, to think about, um, or you know, the status of logic, you know really big mathematics, big, big questions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think you're asking a really good question. And, um, but I, I don't have a lot more. I mean, it, it will just make me think a bit more um, about it, but I don't have, no, I have more to say. All right, thank you. I mean, I also think about it and uh, maybe I'll write you a mail if I have <laughs> a better yeah, way write of me the answer. the question. <laughs> All right, thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, Shinod has a question. Go ahead, Shinod. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. That is um, for me personally. Uh, I like the uh, local approach, uh, but uh, two, 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 two phrasings uh, kind of excited me uh, in the draft as well as in the presentation. Uh, one is the way you you phrased uh, why objectivity is an empirical question. So there you. Kind of stated that a piece of science is uh, objective if it rests on statements uh, that rest on uh, empirical or observation statements. So we made the so that kind of bit puzzling because it's it's in a, it in a way says that a piece of science is empirical uh, if it is uh, we mean to say verifiable rest on observation statements. The other exciting that was. This is one. The other is more exciting. So you kind of stated that the presence of values uh, may uh, help us to ask for uh, more evidence. Uh, later part, uh, you suggested that if you identify it, or if you see values in the research, then you could always uh, ask for uh, more evidence or more empirical data to support your claims. So do there make a distinction between kind of identifying the presence of values, uh, say, in the research uh, versus uh, uh, identifying the employment of values uh, in establishing the results of the uh, research, meaning identifying values in the justificatory part as well as and identifying values in general there in the research. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um... And yeah, I'm not quite clear on what your questions are. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, they aren't good questions. Um, my, you know, gut reaction is that to answer your second question is that um, There are cases where in social research is values all the way down, as it were, um, that they permeate everything. Um, and that there are cases that are quite clear where um, there's evidence and inferences that don't involve values and that the values come in um, at some point uh, later. Um, in the way the science is used, or maybe in what questions are asked, or what somebody uh, combines the, the results with, what some kind of political theory they combine it with, and then draw 
political or moral conclusions. Um, so that it's not inevitable that it's values all the way down, but there are times when it is values all the way down. <coughs> and, you know, I've worried, I worry a lot about that issue, written a bit about it in, in study of psychopathology, for example. Um, if you can actually think that um, they're psychopathological classifications that are not um, uh, seriously value laden. Um, so, you know, my answer to that question is I don't think it's inevitable. Uh, I don't think they have to be involved in all aspects of science, uh, but um, there's certainly uh, cases where they are, and it's interesting to sort out what, where that is and exactly where they're involved. The first question, yeah, remind me again what this question was. If you could. So uh, while uh, phrasing that uh, epistemological questions are uh, an empirical question, uh, you kind of argued that epistemological questions are empirical questions, or sorry, objectivity is empirical. Uh, uh, that means uh, episode science uh, rests on uh, statements uh, that rest on uh, observation statements. So do you mean to say mm -hmm. that the pace of science is uh, very reliable or mm -hmm. is that the mm -hmm. approach you take there? Um, well, I had to say something to the referee and, and um, I didn't want to spend a year um, working. I mean, it's a great question that I was asked and um, I didn't, um, um, it's something, you know, I know I need to come up with a mo more coherent line, but here's roughly what I think about it. I, I mean, I, I'm happy enough to talk about observation statements uh, and so on, but I, I'm, it's quite in a pragmatist sort of way. And um, I'm going to want to look at the context in which you're investigating, what you're trying to find out, what your goals are. Um, what you think you already know, uh, what methods you have that seem to have worked in the past, and so on. And so, um, there, there's lots of stuff that goes on in science, and, and, and Dudley Shapiro made this thing um, pretty clear, Ian Hacking as well, a long time ago. <clears throat> where you're willing to call something an observation statement, like, uh, you know, I just saw a quark, um, uh, and scientists sort of feel that way, and they sort of say that, and to them, that that's uh, right, but, you know, um, the amount of theory and et cetera that went in that's behind that, I just saw a quark, is fairly enormous, but in the context of working, um, it makes uh, it makes real sense um, as opposed to I just saw some noise of, uh, um, that's produced by you know uh, the the um, um, variance of my instrument and uh, that's not a real observation somebody will say and because I you know I can show you how it could have happened by chance with a pretty high probability. And then I take take some step to rule that out, and I see it again, and now I say I'm I'm observing it. So it's that kind of theory laden, background knowledge dependent sort of sense of observation that I have in mind. But I think we do make distinctions um, between what's to us is relatively observable and, and what's not. You know, what's clearly an inference. So in my own work. The choice data. I have the. I know what key they pressed. You know, given what stimulus on the computer, and that's pretty observable to me. But there's theory involved in that. I mean, you know, I have to describe the stimulus and other things, and so I can't do that in a theory-free way. But compared to my, you know, claims that people might be making that these people are, you know. Um, have some elaborate utility function that has five parameters, et cetera. Um, you know, their loss of verse and their, um, 
and they, and they count, uh, they don't like probability losses and so on and so on. That's pretty, pretty unobservable given that I have the clicks and, and the screen. So that's sort of the way I think of it. Okay, uh, thanks, Vinod. Um, uh, Danny uh, Weltman has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm wondering, is being ontologically objective uh, the only way for something to be real or for the only way for something to exist? Or can we say that there are real existent things that aren't ontologically objective? So some people say that uh, social constructions are real and they exist, but they're not ontologically objective, they're subjective. Um, so does that way of talking make, make sense? Or would you say that, look, the only real things are the ontologically objective things? Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe Darcy can answer that for me. Um, no, he's not jumping in. Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, I've written some stuff on this social construction stuff, and, and I have the kind of maybe it's just simple minded view, but I, I sort of say, you know, is class real? Is race real? I have separate papers on that. And I have sort of a Quinean view. Well, um, I'll take it as real if if, um, if I find that my best explanations um, of reality um, um, use it in a way that's um, essential. Um, and there are probably more requirements I have to pile on on that. Um, so um, to me, you know, race and circumstances is uh, socially constructed, but it's about as real as you can get. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to call it ontological real because my best understanding of what happens in American society um, appeals to race as um, a, an essential part of the explanation. And so um, I think it's ontologically real. Um, so I don't, I won't want to make a strong distinction between socially constructed and ontologically real. Um, but then I'm, you know, then your, your response could be, or someone's could be, well, yeah, but surely there's some socially type constructed stuff that you think has a different status. Um, um, and you need to be able to draw a line and then I need to talk about that. Um, but I think, you know, race is part of the natural world out there and it has causal influence and, and there's things that influence it. So um, I can, you know, if something can have causal properties and, and be the cause and be caused by, um, and I can't explain it away, then I think it's ontologically real. I guess that would be my kind of naturalist answer. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you, Danny. Uh, there's someone whose ID is just member. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, you could unmute your mic and ask the question. Yeah. Ah, that's me, Jerama. <laughs> Hi, Harold. Hello. How are you? So I hope you. Oh, are... that guy. <laughs> I know that guy. Yeah, how are you then? Yeah, getting along. So, you know, you made the. Uh, mistake, I guess, of uh, referring to ideas from our misspent youth. So then I decided I <laughs> have to have my 10 cents worth <laughs> of saying. Uh, you see, in some sense, I think, uh, okay, before I get into that, uh, I think uh, uh, I like the very uh, sort of neat way that you ask this question of why whenever there is a, a potential situation of underdetermination, then uh, why is it necessary that we should immediately think of values? Why can't it be simply more evidence? You know, the absence of evidence. Um, the, uh, you, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, even in the standard Quinean underdetermination thesis in the uh, natural sciences and so on and so forth. I think, I, I don't think this argument has been pushed perhaps hard enough, or maybe I don't know the literature well enough that, you know, why can't you simply think of it as evidence? So I found that uh, 
I found that very uh, illuminating. But I think the question that I am asking, what I wish to ask, I think uh, the person who just came before Mr. Weltman, I think uh, he sort of touched upon it. You know? That uh, uh, see, ideas have uh, you know consequences. To possess an idea uh, is uh, not, uh, you know, if an idea did not have consequences in terms of action, in terms of interaction, either verbal interaction or physical interaction, of some form of social interaction, then, uh, you know, we would, we, we would not be interested in ideas. So ideas have, uh, ideas have consequences. So, uh, so even so, the uh, so that is that thing. Uh, I think their link with uh, what you might call uh, what you would like to call ontology, and so yeah, okay. uh, So when you say that uh, uh, these distinctions of ontology are very often, uh, you know, questions that are empirical. Uh, perhaps the word empirical takes us, uh, narrows the realm of our thinking to issues like measurement, observation, etc. And uh, I would say I would prefer the term practice. You know? Okay. So, for instance, uh, okay. uh, the argument for uh, realist uh, views of science is often made that one of the best arguments is that science works. And that's not an observational statement. Uh, that's not an empirical statement in the narrow sense. Uh, and nor is it pragmatic, is sort of empiricism in the active voice rather than the passive voice. But it is practice, which is something, you know, uh, or if you want to put it another way, uh, which covers both uh, all the way from physical sciences to psychology or whatever, you know, causal intervention in the world, you know, causal mm. intervention yep. in the natural or social world eh, yep. is the okay. bridge to the question of ideas to ontology. And I think the Weltman question is a fair one and uh, I, I sort of, uh, until you gave your reply to him, I was going to say, that you were taking it too easy, that you were taking ideas too lightly, you know. So, no, but, but I heard your question, of course, so answer, of course. So I think if we called, think of it in terms of action, the consequences of thought, like uh, Hegel says, you know, somewhere he says, uh, you know, humans are metaphysical, only animals are physical, you know. So there is no human act that is not preceded by thought. You know, there is no building uh, of, uh, you know, laboratory equipment uh, or, uh, you know, of instruments or social interaction that is not preceded by thought. I think thought also has another very important role. Uh, it, 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 Jaram, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, there's a lot of people waiting. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Sorry. think the basic so idea is come uh, This is my point. So yeah. that's uh, uh, that's uh, his thing. Sorry about that. Yeah. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's 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 fun thing about doing these. Is people ask you questions. Um, you get so involved in a paper. You know, you you're lost in paragraph five on, on page six, and it's very easy not to step back and see bigger things that you should really be thinking about. And so so the idea of um, praxis is, is great. And, you know, in a way, it shows that um, you know, my reliable statement was pretty vapid in the sense that, you know, it could, um, it could be a practice that's reliable in producing something or something could be promoting good practices. Um, and you know, I've had things framed uh, still very much on back in my logic, my positivist backgrounds of does the date, this data E 
support the hypothesis H and can I find the rules? And, and then of course I know science is much more complicated and there are good arguments, much more um, social, concrete, um, estimation, uh, you know, evaluations. And so I'll have to think about uh, how to put practice into what I've done, but I, I'm very sympathetic to the general idea. And then and you're talking about ideas is, um, yeah. I, um, all, I, all I wanted to claim was that um, There are a lot of interesting empirical issues in the social sciences um, that can be described by the idealism materialism debate and and, and those a number of those issues are pretty concrete and so um, your general you know Hegelian claim about thought preceding action uh, yeah I can agree to that but thought in what sense by whom and how does it work and so you know, for example, there was a long line, which I think now people are starting to think is wrong, but for a long time it's taken to be the truth in sociology and political science, which is that attitudes as expressed in surveys, et cetera, didn't really explain much of anything in behavior. People would, people would, people will say something on a questionnaire, but it had very little connection to that, what they actually did. And so and that's a concrete kind of empirical issue. Um, so, um, I think to turn your general idea into uh, questions we can pursue, uh, it probably needs to be um, turned into to a, a number of more specific questions. At least that's what I would try to do, but, but, but it's a good question. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Uh, Kabir, uh, uh, you have yep. a question? Uh, thank you for the talk. I just had a quick clarificatory question. So, Professor, when uh, when you were just uh, discussing the uh, the argument that uh, all use, useful uh, social sciences is, is value laden, and then uh, and then you kind of argued against it by uh, by saying that if I were to look at vaccines, uh, the data doesn't. I mean, it seems that there is no like value in that. I, I, but I was just wondering that uh, just looking at the data from say vaccine trials or something uh, is is that even like social science I mean I, I know the boundary is uh, is not as rigid between social science and natural sciences but uh, mm. it, it I mean on the it seems to me just on the like first reading that uh, just the data might not be categorized as, as social sciences so in a sense I mean the proponent of the argument might mm. say that's not social sciences. Uh, that's maybe, that's maybe natural science. Maybe just some like symbols on a paper. That's it. Uh, so you're not like uh, it's, your attack is like not that valid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. That's a that, that's a, a fine question. I mean, basically, I took Dupre to be making some general claim about if. Uh, some category is about what's useful for humans, and therefore it's value laden, and that that would be a general argument about an uh, argument um, that would cut across the social and natural sciences. And maybe I'm unfair to him because he was talking about the social sciences. Um, so then we, um, my counterexample is one uh, arguably from the natural sciences, as you point out. Um, so then we, you know, revise the argument and say if it's um, useful and it's uh, a social science category, then it's got to be value laden. Um, and I, I imagine there are ways you could spell that out because we're interested. It's usefulness for social relations or something like that. So it's um, the social is brought in essentially, um, which is what Dupre is trying to do. So that's probably a, a better formulation of the argument. And thanks for that. I'll, I'll go back and look at that and see if I can make it more subtle. Um, but then, I, you know, I, I would still disagree. Um, the, um, 
I, I uh, we, we can um, have lots of discussions, but there's tons of stuff in the so what's clearly social science that I think um, is involves categories of stuff that's of use to us, but we think it's uh, pretty well objective and not a matter of, of value, uh, uh, or just moral values. And so just lots of econ economic data, for example, uh, I would argue that. Um, but, you know, I have to look at the specific data. Um, I mean, in, you know, my behavioral science research, I mean, my data are, are you know, clicks on the right lottery or the left lottery. And um, that stuff, I think, um, is hopefully useful. The categories I'm using to, to describe it are useful, but I don't know that it's value laden. But, um, but you're asking a good question. Um, and a better, I, I would do better in that argument um, by um, citing social science research where it was useful and obviously objective. Um, so, um, you know, the market price of something over a period uh, is the kind of thing that um, I'm thinking of, but um, that certainly could get more complicated. So, yeah, good question. Okay, uh, thanks, Kabir. Uh, Abhishek, uh, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk, Professor. Uh, my question relates to the discussion about the relation between value ladenness in science and uh, objectivity. Uh, so when you're discussing the, the, the whole argument from underdetermination that if your choice is underdetermined, so there would be some uh, values, non-epistemic values that are at play uh, to determine the choice really. And uh, so I feel that your response is a bit defensive than you actually need to be. Uh, because still the onus would be on the person who says that value ladenness goes against objectivity to show that it actually does. Because there is a lot of work in literature which shows that uh, at the community level, I mean, value-laden decisions or biased decisions can actually lead to improve the uh, uh, optimize the epistemic chances. And because you adopt a theological framework, because you see the, the justification for, for instance, objectivity in terms of how it leads to the attainment of epistemic ends. So, at the level of community, for instance, the work of Peter, uh, the, the 93 book, or more recently the work of Michael Stevens, it shows that presence of biases can actually optimize uh, the attainment of epistemic ends at the level of the community. Uh, so I don't think really that we need to concede to the person who is argue, arguing that uh, theory choice is uh, uh, value laden, that it necessarily leads to loss of objectivity. At the level of community, a uh, biased decision can actually lead to, uh, well, uh, increase in objectivity. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm writing these things down. Um, yes, that, uh, that's, uh, you, you were breaking up a uh, fairly, uh, Significantly, but um, the gen uh, general point that I got um, that values, at least at the community level, can promote objectivity, um, not uh, hinder it. And uh, you're certainly right that people have given lots of examples, and there's a whole literature on this in the social, social epistemology side. And um, I mean, going back to Kitcher, um, showing that, you know little models where you have agents who are um, uh, biased or self-interested, but the biases and uh, the distribution of biases uh, uh, as an aggregate can produce objective results. Um, and I think all that's right, and I wasn't trying to, uh, I wouldn't deny any of that. Um, so, um, I should go back in and, and at the very least sort of say, uh, I'm not uh, saying this is not the case, um, um, but in my, my quarrel is with the people who, who are, are drawing, you know, anti, uh, you know, subjectivist conclusions from value ladenness. So <clears throat> the people who are arguing that value ladenness um, doesn't, compromise objectivity or sort of on the side that I'm on. So um, I should acknowledge that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, good point. 
Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Prakash Thadabal, do you have a question? Could you please unmute and ask it? Are you there? I was wondering if a, if a distinction, kind of a presupposition can be made between uh, in science about the production of knowledge versus the utilization of uh, the research. So uh, the, looking at that kind of a distinction, which actually brings in this uh, idea of, uh, you know, is there a distinction between theory and practice? And uh, maybe a little, uh, uh, if you push that a little further, whether uh, practice is capable of producing knowledge. And I'm thinking in terms of the social sciences, uh, I'm, I'm uh, more prone to think that it is uh, concerned with uh, the production of knowledge in practice. And therefore I wanted to know what, what would be the implications of your uh, stance, especially the contextual stance uh, uh, regarding the application, uh, the results, and, and, uh, and what it does to the, uh, what the questions is raised is about the status of social sciences. And uh, so that I, I just wanted to have uh, some inputs on that. Okay, yeah, good, good. Yeah, no, that's, um, that, those questions are certainly uh, lurking in the background in the paper, for sure. Um, um, May I just add I one mean, small uh, addition because I, I want to limit it to one question. My concern is what happens when you take this radical empirical local stance to uh, the idea of generalizability. You know, mm -hmm. are we giving up that and are we making, are, are we may now uh, willing to accept that uh, at least the social sciences are purely local and you know, mm. there's no idea of, uh, yep. yeah. thank you. Okay, I think there are multiple questions in there. I think you cheated, but that's okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> they're all interesting. Um, See, um, I mean the utilization of science issue. Um, you know, I, I maybe I didn't make it clear, but I certainly wanted to leave it open and, and, and to, in fact tried to say, but maybe not so obviously, that um, there's a big difference between values and gathering evidence for, versus values and deciding what to investigate versus values and how you use the science uh, values um, involved in, you know, what you take the science to imply, um, which aren't maybe not part of the science itself. Um, so all, all those kinds of areas, I think um, values can be involved in. Um, they're important uh, to look at. Um, I just uh, want to say for asking about objectivity, we have to ask about which of those things are we looking at? And is up to, um, we worried about uh, objectivity and utilization or objectivity and um, gathering, the, deciding what question to look at or objectivity and how I, you know, I've got a set of numbers and I, you know, take the logarithm of something because it's nonlinear and logs are, are easier to deal with. Um, so we have, to distinguish all those, and that's that's a local uh, empirical issue, I think. Um, your worry about your question about generalization, I think, is great. Um, and I've been writing about this contextualist stuff or defending some kind of view for yeah, quite a while now. And um, if you know, I get a breathing point, and if I step back and get out of you know what's what the referee said about paragraph five on page six, and try to think about the bigger picture, I think that's really an you know, interesting question. How do I frame that? Um, I mean, how far do I want to go in saying things are local, I and mean, yeah. doesn't that in the end, um, you know, turn into you know? ideographic, all you can describe is a particular case and um, that's all you can say. And, um, I'm, you know, I don't want to be driven down that alley um, for sure. So I need a way of talking about things are local without turning it into, it's just one, what's that phrase from, you know, one thing after the other, like booming confusion. I don't know who that comes from, but it's, from uh, yeah, 
Whitman or somebody. Um, so, Jim James, I think. Okay, thank you. R right century, uh, American, yeah, okay. Yes, thanks. Um, so I, that's really a good question and I really need to have a story about that. Um, and, um, you know, again, I think it's going to be kind of an interesting empirical story because, um, you know, uh, I'm doing, I'm with this group doing this experimental, behavioral experimental research <coughs> where there's this idea that people have attitudes about risk and time and social attitude, pro-social attitudes, and we're just talking about their attitudes simpliciter. And of course, that, that's probably wrong. It's probably more local than that, but we don't only get stuck with, you know, they don't have any attitudes at all other than their attitude about what I'm showing them on the computer screen today at three. So I need a framework for trying to um, talk about those things and um, you're pointing that out and that um, I, I don't really have it. So um, I'm thinking about it, but thanks. Thanks for pressing me. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. So um, by some remarkable coincidence or providence, uh, the raised hands have run out at exactly the time that we uh, intended to end this, uh, 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 this talk. Um, thanks a lot, Harold, for a wonderful talk and for staying with us for so long to address all the questions. Um, and thanks to all the participants, uh, the ones who left and the ones who remain. Um, I hope uh, you'll all be joining us uh, for future lectures as well. Uh, uh, signed up for the mailing list. We'll send you information about it. Um, so once again, uh, thank you so much, Harold. And uh, uh, thank you for everyone else uh, for participating as well. Thank you, thank you very much. It was great fun and I learned a lot. So uh, good luck with the series. Okay, great. Okay. I'll close the lecture now. Uh, hope to see you all again next week. Cheers.